or more or less the scientific facts mentioned in the documentary. Um, and in the next part, we are going to uh, talk about, about some argument-related um, topics. Okay, and um, here is the structure of the whole documentation, of the whole documentary. So, um, it is divided into three major parts. The first one is what is smog, the second one is where did smog come from, and um, the last one is how should we do, or how should we confront these questions. And as you can see, um, as you can see, um, we have also listed several keywords, um, like key points, under each chapter. So, we are now going to begin with the first chapter, um, what is smog. Uh, in the explanation of smog, um, Chai Jing began directly with the definition of PM2.5. PM2.5 is defined as airborne particles with a diameter of um, 2.5 micrometers or smaller. So they lower down the visibility by reflecting a big amount of visible light. However, they, are, they themselves are invisible for human eyes. And uh, in the documentary, Chai Ding did an experiment by carrying on um, a, a machine with her the whole day with a filter on it in order to filter out um, the PM2.5 particles in order to measure the amount of it. And uh, her, in her, her example, the result was more than 300 micrograms each uh, cubic meter. So this result is five times of the standard in China and 12 times of the standard by WHO, which is a World Health Organization. And the second point in the first chapter is uh, carcinogens. Carcinogens are elements that can cause cancer, possibly. So in her example, um, there are 15 carcinogens contained in the air. One of them comes to the most dangerous carcinogens, and it's called benzo a -pyrene. And this benzo a pyrene comes to 14 times of the Chinese standard of safety threshold. And um, after that, she mentioned the possible correlations of smog and um, other diseases. So um, at the very beginning, she mentioned the empirical fact, uh, which is referred to the heavy smog, smog in January 2013, during which time uh, visits of emergency departments in hospitals increased in 2027 20, cities um, between 10 to 150 percent. And um, the second one is, um, is based on an internet article published by NetEase, which is a very big and very famous web portal in China. And the article states that lung cancer has increased by 465 percent in the last 30 years. Um, and some people say that children may adapt to they may adapt to air pollution um, after a while. So with this question, Chai Jing um, went to Edward Lawrence Abel at the University of Southern California, um, who denied this assumption and uh, explains that children in cleaner places grow faster than children growing up in polluted areas. And um, he also mentioned that poor lung functions early in life is a predictor of lung problems later on in life. And uh, the last point of the first chapter um, is that she mentioned that smog is actually not a new phenomenon, not a new problem at all. Smog has already existed for over a decade. And um, at the beginning, people were just not aware of, of the problem and smog was often referred to or, um, or labeled as fog at that time. And now we are finished with the first chapter, I'm coming to, come to the se uh, second chapter dealing with um, where did smog come from. So um, one clear argument in her, in her um, documentary is that smog is caused by human activities. Human activities are mainly accountable for the air pollution of today's China. And um, the argument is that um, chemical stuffs, which are found in PM2.5, um, 
They are not all, but, may, but most of them actually come from human activities. For example, 60% um, of PM2.5 actually come from um, the burning of fossil fuels, including um, burning coals and burning, burning oil. And the other parts might be dust, and dust could be caused by deforestation, um, uh, deforestation um, or uh, other industrial products. So now we are coming to one of the major causes, um, which is the coal. And uh, on the graph, you can see the development of the coal consumption. Uh, in the background, you see the industrial countries, and in the foreground, you see the red line, which represents China. So um, due, due to the rapid industrialization, um, after, let's say, after this, um, the, the 70s, uh, the use of coal in China rises while dropping in other developed countries, in the industrial countries, because they have already switched from coal to other energy, cleaner energy. And uh, burning coal is directly linked to constructing steel. And um, the country, after burning high quality coals, um, the country began to burn um, coals of low quality. For example, um, the so-called the so brown coals, um, which, is so, which is also called um, lignite in English. Um, lignites are used to very massive extent in China and without preparation. Um, here I would like to add some, a piece of information from Germany because according to Wikipedia, um, more than 25% um, of the German electricity actually also comes from lignite. So the crucial point here is not whether you have used these brown coals or not, but whether you have prepared them well or not. Have you washed them or um, stick to the rules to prepare them? If not, they would cause a um, fatal problem to the environment. And um, now we are coming to, the, to another uh, major reason for um, PM2.5, which is petroleum. And also, as you can see in the graph, which shows um, different kinds of sources of PM2.5 in Beijing. Um, the red one represents motor vehicles, and every one of them would use um, petroleum. And uh, it costs more than 30% on this graph. Um, so one reason for, for, this, um, for this rapid increase is uh, the increase of um, automobiles amount itself. And also, in bigger cities, it often comes to traffic jams. And during the traffic jams, the cars waste more energy than usual. And uh, as, you, as you can imagine, in Chinese big, big cities, there's traffic, there are traffic jams every day. So um, there's still one more important factor, which is the quality of the burning fuel, of the burning um, petroleum. Um, but we will come back to this point later. And um, now we are finished with the second chapter, and we are coming to the third chapter. Um, how should we do? How should, should we deal with the problem? And uh, in the documentary, Chai Ting said that 50% um, of the pop pollutants should be cut in order to achieve clean air in Beijing. Or in other words, in order to see the blue sky in bigger cities again. Um, and then she mentioned several success stories uh, from the industrial societies, and one, one of them happened in Southern California. Um, in Southern California, um, diesel vehicles are required to install so-called vehicle particulate filter, which have filtered out 99% of the particles um, um, to, to, to prevent them uh, to come into the air. And otherwise, the owners or the drivers, they would be fined. Um, in the example, in the documentary, the driver was fined, was charged um, thousands of dollars for not installing this, this uh, filter. And uh, another example is London. London reduced its pollutants by 80% in within 10 years. And the English passed the so-called Clean Air Act in 1959. And coals are washed clean before being sold. Also, the use of unprepared coals in uh, open grid at home 
uh, would be considered illegal at that time. Um, and Chai Jing interviewed um, Edward Daly, who was who is for, who is the former parliamentary under secretary of state at the Department for Business Innovation and Skills in the UK. And um, Edward Davy said to Chai, Chai Jing that if an industry is on its way out, there is always another industry coming up. So in the end, Chai Jing proposed that Chai Jing proposed that natural gas um, could be a clean alternative, a clean energy alternative for China. And furthermore, competitions between companies could also push forward the uh, innovations. And the monopoly, in contrary, should um, impede heavily the, um, the, the innovations on the market. Um, so to conclude, um, the reforms of energy systems and better policies and also a freer market, according to her, would be the solutions to defeat pollutions for China. Okay, now we are finished with the first part and we are coming to the second part which contains more conflictual or also um, controversial points. Um, you, might be, you might agree with them or not. Um, these are all points related to arguments you might use later in the discussion session. So the first one is monopoly in the industry. And it is quite obvious in the movie that um, a Chai Jing challenged the monopoly system in, uh, in the ener energy industry. Uh, for example, the petroleum industry set very low standards for the quality of diesel and gasoline. The reason behind it is, is quite simple. The standard committee which set the standards for the market consists basically of people who are also in the same energy industry, in the oil industry, um, which are PetroChina and Sinopec. Although China has the, the technologies um, to tackle this problem, to improve the quality of fuel, um, these companies are not, encouraged, are not encouraged to do so because if they are improving the quality of the fuel, um, it, would, uh, it, it would mean for them a higher cost and then also lower profits. And as they already have these monopoly positions um, in the whole market, they would also like to keep them. And that is also why uh, it is so difficult for the other supervisory departments to tackle this problem. So, um, one way to break out of the monopoly might be the restructuring of the industry, uh, which is also suggested in the film, um, which could be a solution for better com competitiveness and also for better innovations. Um, in fact, we have found here um, a graph uh, made by Ma and He in 2008. And this graph is related to China's electric utility, um, to the restructuring of it, from the, uh, from the pre pre-reform state monopoly to the latest stage. So we are going to begin, begin with a pre-reform state monopoly. And uh, at this age, the electric utility was, monos um, was um, mon monopolistically um, controlled by the central government completely. Um, and so, in the mid mid eighties, um, deregulations have been launched. They have begun. So uh, the whole industry moved from the first stage to the second stage, which is called generation promotion. And in the generation promotion period, the prior the priority was to attract investments from other sectors than the state, um, because um, the generation capacity before in the first stage has been very low. And after that comes the third stage, which is um, the state entrepreneurialism. And in this, state, uh, in this stage, the priority was the clear definition, the separation of responsibilities um, between the governmental administration and the business operation. And um, then comes the fourth stage, which is called monopoly dismantlement. And as, as the name already suggests, um, 
The focus in this stage is to break out of the vertical monopoly um, of the state power corporation. And um, after that stage comes the last stage, clean and efficient, efficient power. And because of the co-intensive nature in the, in the uh, electric industry in China, um, um, pollutions have been increased and also the pollutant related health problems have occurred with it. <coughs> mm. so, um, so according to the uh, circumstances, renewable energy will be more important and will call more attention. Um, however, in this, in this um, paper, Ma and Le also also wrote down that the last two stages, the monopoly dismantlement and clean and efficient power, they are still ongoing process, which means they are still not achieved. And um, there are also people who are fundamentally disagree with this, this chart um, because, um, because for them, China has never achieved, um, they, they have never um, undergone this uh, process of monopoly dismantlement because what was done was to cut, cut one, whole, one huge company into small pieces. And, um, and um, the state enterprises, they still hold, hold whole companies. So um, the real market competition has never been achieved. And now to the third point, the administration of environmental protection or also the supervision of the environmental protection. Um, from the movie, from the film, we, can, we know that 70% 70, 70 of all cars in China are diesel and the emissions of nitrogen dioxide of them, of these deep diesel cars, are 70%. And uh, the, emission of, um, the, the emission of the primary particles are 90%. So, um, also in the documentary, Chai Jing told us that um, there is always a pollution peak every night at 12 o'clock and every day. So, the reason behind it is said to be these kind of diesel cars. Um, these diesel cars lack the basic emission control equipment. However, many of them still possess the um, environmental protection labels. And um, after that, um, they called the police, um, in the documentary, the police caught one driver um, with, a, with a car like this on the road. And um, after that, the driver was not punished he was not fine at all because according to the police everything this particular driver has done was legal so um, Chai, after that Chai Ting interviewed, um, interviewed a guy from um, the, the Ministry of Envir Environmental Protection and um, he said that this problem is actually well known in the industry so the, the question here is um, how could it happen that these kind of diesel cars, without any emission, uh, emission, um, without any environmental protection equipment, um, be tolerated on the roads. And more surprisingly, um, how could this fact be well known to um, to the environmental supervisors without tagging them? So um, the answer is actually there are legal to deal with it. However, um, due to the vague definitions, due to the vague definitions in laws, um, there is no institution who regards itself as responsible for these cars or as accountable for this problem. Uh, and also, the quality of diesel and gasoline um, is very low um, for these for these um, diesel cars. They are they are far more lagging behind the Chinese standards. So um, there's basically very few, very, um, very few high quality fuel provided on the market. And um, the question now is who should be or who can be the driving force to increase the supervisory power um, in the whole environmental questions? 
Um, and here we proposed four different dimensions to solve the problem. The first one is supervision from the civil society, which means um, simple measures. Uh, you come to a gasoline station and you think that um, someone here is not working properly or correctly, and uh, then you call the number offered in, in the documentary um, to inform the departments. Or you could also organize uh, activities in order to increase um, the awareness concerning environmental protection. The second one is NGO. Um, well, um, the second proposal is um, like, the, like how NGO is working in Western countries. Um, NGO play a very important role as counterparts to enterprises and sometimes also governments. So maybe uh, an increasing power in NGO would also be, um, be a key point to solve the problem. And the second one, uh, the third one mentioned here, is a well-built legislative system, which means that we are going to tackle each individual problem with, um, with clearly defined, defined law. And uh, the last point here, it sounds kind of weird, but I'm going to explain it later. We call it authoritarian measures, and um, with this word, we mean each measure um, which is imposed by the state, however, not included in the legislative system. Because um, in the Chinese context, and also currently, many rules have been executed by the state, however, without really going through this legislative system. And uh, we would also call these parts um, the authoritarian measures. And um, it is obvious that um, none of them can handle the whole problem individually. However, um, the combination of them, or the interaction of them, um, could, could provide a better solution to <coughs> the super, supervision problem. Okay. Beside environmental protection, the environmental inequality has also aroused many discussions, especially in the U.S. Um, in the U.S., the exposure to environmental pollution is unevenly distributed across racial groups and class groups. And racial minorities and um, the poor people um, generally suffer from more pollution than the whites and the middle class. And um, Schneisberg, uh, Schneisberg argues with the theory of treatment of protection that um, in a capitalist society there is an ever-growing need for, um, for capital investments and also an, an ever-growing need for, um, for energy and for materials. Um, so there are, con uh, there are continuously two dynamics going on. The first one is the creation of um, is the creation of economic wealth, and the second one is the creation of negative byproducts. And um, the economic wealth is not evenly distributed um, in the whole society, and um, the so-called vulnerable groups are more likely to suffer from um, environmental pollution or industrial pollution, and um, these vulnerable groups comprises um, the poor, the unskilled laborers, and the skilled blue colors. Um, unfortunately, there has been very few analysis on the environmental inequality in China. However, we have found one, one uh, study conducted by Ma in um, 2010. And the conclusion of his study is that in China, rural residents and rural migrants suffer more from um, environmental, uh, environmental pollution than the others. Um, we think that um, while discussing any issue related to the environment, uh, the environmental inequality is also very important. Uh, and therefore, we ask the question, if a further restructuring process is going on, can the environmental inequality, uh, inequality be solved or reinforced? Um, I don't know, has anybody understood this question so far? If not, I'm, I'm going to explain it for, uh, explain it 
um, um, for example, if you are going to tackle this question with technological innovations, of course, there will be no problem. However, if you are going to say, um, we want to uh, have clean air, clean air in Hebei or Beijing, and you move the whole factories from this area to another, you actually do, don't solve the problem. And by doing so, the migrant workers most may also follow the factories from one city to another. So um, actually, you haven't solved the problem at all. In contrary, you have increased the environmental inequality. And here comes our last point. Where is the future? Um, here, three points mentioned on this slide are similar to, um, to the other slides. But here, we are going to lead the question to a totally different direction, which means how would you see the future generally? And the first point is technological innovations, um, which we have, um, we have not talked so far. And um, as Chai Jing points out, that the natural gas could be a possible clean energy solution for China, we did some research in the related areas. So, um, can natural gas, or in our case, we focus on shale gas, guarantee a brighter future? Um, we uh, we took, um, if you have followed our Facebook page, you would have seen this video last week. This is from, um, from, from an institution, and um, the man on the photo is uh, an expert in this issue, shale gas. So, he represents the opinion that China has a huge potential in um, the production of shale gas, or in shale gas reserves. Um, however, a shale gale or a shale revolution won't happen until 2020. The first argument, Sichuan Basin and Tarun Basin are two locations where, um, where you can find most of um, the shale gas reserves. However, these are also, these are also two particular locations in China um, whose infrastructures are very poor or insufficient. And this does not only include pipelines or vehicles, special vehicles, but sometimes there are not even proper roads there for transportation. So in order to achieve success in these two areas, there's still, there's still a very long way to go. And um, the, second, uh, the second argument is that the development can be impeded by low competition in the Chinese market. And this argument is closely related to Chai Jing's argument. Um, according to him, uh, for example in the US, um, there are many different companies working on the shale gas production. So, at the same time, there are different smaller companies digging in the southern areas in the U.S., and which, which um, increases the possibility to find the right spot. And um, in China, there are, well, maybe three companies would be able to do that, and all, all of them um, are state-based. So um, it is. It is not, according to him, it is not possible that these three companies will keep on this process on different spots. So uh, the possibility for them to find the right spot is relatively low. And um, also, um, after two or three years, um, because these these companies in China they are bigger and they also have um, have their have, um, have productions in oil or in coal in other areas. So, um, so after two or three years, they will see that the profit in shale gas at the very beginning is not very high. So they might stop with the project or uh, they might not invest so much um, in the innovations um, concerning shale gas development or shale, uh, shale gas production. And uh, the, the last one is quite straightforward, which is the lack of know-how. And it both consists in uh, the bigger companies in China and also in the smaller companies. 
So here we provide a um, graph which um, should be a support um, to think of different dimensions. Um, actually, um, there should be civil society, states, and enterprises below. Uh, these are different dimensions to, uh, to tackle these problems. And then we also added different levels. You can begin with an individual level, local level, regional level, and national level. So um, these could be dimensions uh, you, could, you can think of later in the discussions. It's supposed to be support for you. References? And thank you for your attention. And you open the door and you step inside. We're inside our hearts. Now imagine your pain is a white ball of healing light. That's right. Falling apart. This is your life. This is your life. This is your life. This is your life. Doesn't get.